I want to say I thank God for all of you. I thank God that people like uh, John Hill, Tibbs Maxey, Bill Reese are preserved unto this day to enjoy our fellowship. Amen. We remember Hebrews 13, 7. Consider your elders, those who have taught you the word of God and admonished you and considering the issue of their life, imitate their faith. Amen. I thank God for these children that have been so well behaved. Yes. I hope that uh, you have not become tired of this subject. You've heard a lot of us older fellows uh, shout and, and reason and rant about the doctrines of the blood, and uh, you may hear some things that seem to differ. Don't worry about our difference. That's what we agree on that's important, but we hope you're not getting tired of the subject. I think that it's important for us to give a sustained attention, extended attention to some things so that they soak into our minds and they affect our feelings and they become somewhat more real to us. These things we're talking about are largely in figures of speech, and that sometimes misleads. We'll be saying a little bit more about that. They are often things of which we uh, have no visual image and not, not easy just to, to conceive. But uh, it does pay us to look at the central things of God's Word uh, repeatedly and well. This, uh, Amen. this subject just shows how central in importance is the vicarious atonement of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And uh, we're looking at it from various ways and with more or less uh, effective ways of expression about it. The topic Tuesday was the same when Charles Gresham was here, and he had a good, thorough, and biblical study on it. And uh, at the time he started to say almost the same things I started to say right at the beginning. Do you ever say, have you had communion today? Or did you ever say, uh, uh, is it wrong to have communion on Thursday? I've heard arguments about this. You know. Well, do we think that communion is only the Lord's Supper? Look with me in 1 Corinthians 10, the 16th verse, and you'll see where we get this expression, the only time it's in the New Testament, the communion of the blood. Because... The blood is important, and the word communion uh, is a word for many expressions of fellowship, sharing, contribution, belonging to one another. That's of great importance. The study needs to be made, but not much of it in this text. 1 Corinthians 10, 16. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not a participation in or a communion of or sharing with the blood of Christ. Mm -hmm. The bread which we break, is it not a participation in or a communion of or sharing in the body of Christ? Now he's talking to the church about whether or not to participate in the feasts of idol sacrifice and idol worship. Meats that have been sacrificed to idols are offered in public feasts or community neighborhood gatherings or maybe just family gatherings and he has said so far that the idol isn't anything mm -hmm. and it's a matter of uh, your effect upon other people's conscience in the 8th chapter. Mm -hmm. But here he's saying, isn't it a fact that your participating, participation in the Lord's Supper, the cup of the juice that represents the blood of Christ, is an association with, a belonging to, a participation in the blood of Christ. Mm -hmm. So also... To eat at the table of the feast to the idol is a participation in that idol. Mm -hmm. And I would not have you participate with the idols. Now let's read it again from the 17th verse. Oh, the 18th. Consider the people of Israel. They are not those who eat the sacrifices, partners in the altar there. Maybe you didn't know that there were various kinds of sacrifices in which the fat was to be burned and the blood, of course, was to be poured out and the, the kidneys and the liver and all the fat off the entrails and some parts especially were to be burned and sacrificed to God, then sometimes a particular hind leg was assigned to the priests to be cooked for them to eat and then other parts of the body, I guess, were for the 
the sacrificers and their friends and family to partake of. It was not strange for the families of Israel to eat the flesh of the sacrifices that were made unto God. This is discussed in Leviticus, the 17th chapter, particularly. Here he is saying, when you participate in the Lord's Supper at the church, you just drink the cup and eat the bread, you connect yourself with as belonging to and sharing in the blood of Christ and the body of Christ. Amen. Now, if you go to the idols feast and you eat at the table of idols, you connect yourself with and make yourself too much a participant in the worship of the idol. So back to your text again. 19. What am I implying then? That food offered to idols is anything or idol is anything? No, really not. Not actually anything. I imply that what pagans sacrifice they offer to demons and not to God. Now, I don't know what is the truth behind this. This is about the only revelation in the New Testament. That idols are a an instrument of satanic evil spirits, mm -hmm. demons. Mm -hmm. Making an idol out of wood and bowing down to it seems like just uh, exercise in futility and stupidity. Mm -hmm. And Isaiah 44 and the other passages deal with how stupid it is to cut down a tree and carve out an idol and cook your food with the rest of it and, and then say you're worshiping what you worked on with your own hands. And the idol can't speak, and the idol doesn't do anything, and isn't doesn't amount to anything. But when you begin to worship it, it becomes an instrument of Satan. Mm -hmm. Amen. No one can say Jesus is Lord except by the aid of the Holy Spirit. First Corinthians Amen. twelve three. Twelve three. Mm -hmm. No one by the Spirit can say Jesus is accursed. Amen. There is an operation of the Spirit of God in the life of the one who receives the message from God and lets it control his life so he gives expression of confession to the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 That is how by the Holy Spirit we can say Jesus is Lord. Mm -hmm. Now incidentally, going down 10 verses to the 13th verse in 1 Corinthians 12, he says, by the one Spirit, one, we are all baptized into one body and made to drink of the same spirit. Mm -hmm. Amen. He's talking about water baptism. Just as by one spirit we can confess that Jesus is Lord, by one spirit we... And by the spirit doesn't mean... The translations deceive you by making it sound like you're baptized in the spirit. The Greek uses the word in to mean... Uh, to, to express the idea of by the instrumentality of, through the agency of, the Holy Spirit, we become uh, able to confess Jesus as Lord and able to be baptized in obedience to his word. Mm -hmm. It's not Holy Spirit baptism at all. Amen. But people seize upon the words of this 13th verse of the 12th chapter to make a, a doctrine sound biblical that is not biblical. Yeah. Call it baptism of the Holy Spirit. There. John the Baptist said in Matthew 3, 11, that Christ will baptize in the Holy Spirit and in fire. Mark said in the Holy Spirit. Luke 3, 16 mentions, I believe, without the fire. And John 1, he, he quotes John the Baptist saying, the one who sent me to baptize in the water told me on whomsoever you see the Spirit descending and abiding on him. This is he who baptizes in the Holy Spirit in descending about fire. Especially in Luke 3, John had been preaching a lot about fire. He is coming, the one after me, whose shoes I'm not worthy to untie, whose fan or winnowing shovel is in his hand to cleanse his threshing floor. The wheat he'll gather into his garner, the chaff he'll burn with asbestos fire. At least that's the Greek word he uses. Unquenchable fire. We've changed the meaning from unquenchable to, to uh, unkindleable. <laughs> I don't know how we got that switch. But the Greek says asbestos fire. <clears throat> he said the axe is already, already laid at the root of every tree. Every tree that brings forth not good fruit be cut down and cast into the fire. 
John was preaching about fire, and he said, this is the one who will baptize you in the Holy Spirit and in fire. He didn't say who. And when uh, John the Baptist got this same message about the baptism of Jesus, the one on whom you see the Spirit descending, this is the one who baptized the Holy Spirit. He's not talking about who is to be baptized, but who is the baptizer in the Holy Spirit, identifying Jesus in this great way. <clears throat> And then you don't hear anything more about baptism in the Holy Spirit until the first chapter of Acts. Jesus appeared to the apostles by the space of 40 days, showing himself alive by many infallible proofs and speaking to them things concerning the kingdom of God. And being gathered together with them, he said, You heard the promise of the Father, which you heard from me. You stay here in this city. And depart not from it, because you will be baptized in the Holy Spirit here in a few days, not many days from now. So then the second chapter begins. When the day of Pentecost was come, they were all with one accord in one place, and the Spirit descended, and they, it said the Spirit was poured out upon them. And they all spoke with other languages as the Spirit gave them utterance. I want to warn you about taking figures of speech as if they were literal. And this is a good place to, to see that. I've had people very sincerely think that because the apostles were baptized in the Holy Spirit, Jesus said they were going to be, and because the Holy Spirit poured out upon them, therefore baptism is by pouring. But the trouble is, baptism in the Holy Spirit in the first place is a figure of speech. And the Holy Spirit poured out is a figurative way, a metaphorical verb. There's no way that the Holy Spirit is in a big picture in God's hand and is poured over people. And you don't want to take one figure of speech, combine another figure of speech, and draw a conclusion that sounds logical. That you don't have uh, propositions for logical use in that sense. Now, I've put in my notes several days ago that I wanted to quote from a great hymn. Bane and blessing, pain and pleasure by the cross are sanctified. And we've sung it a couple of times. I'm glad you like it. I would like the song, In the Cross of Christ I Glory, yes. towering o'er the wrecks of time, all the light of sacred story gathers around its head sublime. Mm -hmm. But you see, figures of speech like that make good poetry and make good songs. But I contend that it's not the cross that glorifies or sanctifies the pleasures and the sorrows of life. It's the Christ of the cross. It's what happened on the cross. It's the one who had the experience of the cross that sanctifies bane and blessing, pain and pleasure. And you know that's true. We call attention to it. One time a number of years ago, I wish you could remember how many, some 30 years ago or so, I had the privilege of rooming a whole week in a Christian conference with Frank Houston, a songwriter, a hymn writer, whose hymns used to be in the book, and one that I used before I ever knew him or ever thought I'd ever meet him, was The Christ of the Cross. I think at some meeting in Ohio I tried to sing it as a solo or a duet with somebody. It goes something like, The Cross of the Christ, let others who will praise the Cross of the Christ, the Christ of the Cross is my theme. And it, it goes along like that. I remember getting acquainted with Frank Houston, the songwriter. He was older than I at the time, and uh, he is not living anymore, I'm rather sure. And he said he had plenty of tunes. He just wished he could find some very good words with which to write more hymns. And uh, you perhaps remember the hymn, It Pays to Serve Jesus. It pays every day. It pays every step of the way. Mm -hmm. The pathway to glory may sometimes be drear, but you'll be happy, uh, and, and so forth. Um, I knew some of his songs, but I appreciated what he was saying, that people exalt the cross sometimes to forget about the Christ. Yes. Yes. Now, when we've talked about some things that the blood did, um, maybe we have not been uh, as literal and accurate as we could be, although we have meant the right things associated with it, and we've had some of the right feelings about it. 
I told Brother Charles Gresham, Charlie and I have known each other for a half century or so, and, and uh, we used to meet at the Kaimisha Clinic and here and there. One time he actually made a solemn promise to me that if I'd write a textbook on hermeneutics, he would see that it got published. That's a very significant promise. I proposed a certain size or uh, a book of this sort to the Christian Standard one time when Oren Root was on the committee, and Oren's one of my best friends. I've lived with him for two years in, uh, in the same room, and uh, they turned it down. And then the college press published the one that Lynn Gardner and I put together, Learning from God's Word, and it's sold out here, but it's published in, in Russian in two or three times as many copies, and it's still available in Russia. So if you want to read it, go to Russia and buy one. In. Or I can lend you the Russian one. In. <clears throat> but Charlie was that kind of a friend. Years ago, when he, before he ever went back to Kentucky, he was publishing a quarterly scholarly journal, and he had me write an article on in Bible interpretation, and he was impressed with it. He thought I should expand it into it. I always felt the need for hermeneutics books, and I kept working on some views who have been my students remember what huge notebook we had, one big notebook for the fall semester and one for the spring semester in hermeneutics. And then others took over the course, and of course now it's their hands. I tried to, to uh, set a kind of a, of a standard or a, a model for pursuing the study of Bible words, Bible grammar, Bible context, historical circumstances, and the view of each passage in view of the whole scripture in its context. And uh, I, I really would like to spend another lifetime with that kind of pursuit, for that matter. What are we saying that for? I want to call your attention to a text now that will illustrate Romans 3.25 been brought up today. And what was said was not wrong about it, but you often read it. And in fact, I noticed Dallas read it right, that God made Christ, set forth Christ to be a propitiation for our sins through his blood by faith. Mm -hmm. The King James doesn't put a comma between through faith mm -hmm. and in his blood mm -hmm. and doesn't interpret the in phrase, the instrumental phrase in Greek as instrumental it interprets as if it were the object of the faith. I think in view of the whole book of Romans and the whole New Testament that it's wrong to say by faith in the blood. I don't put any faith in the blood. My faith is in the Lord Jesus Christ who shed his blood voluntarily, Amen. not because the blood was the instrument of our salvation, but because his death fulfilled the law and made God, like, but it goes on to say there in Romans, made God to be righteous even in the passing over sins done aforetime. The Lord, judge of all the earth, must do right. And the Amen. judge cannot say the Amen. sinner is guiltless without being guilty himself. Amen. God cannot say, I'm not a sinner, without becoming a kind of sinner himself, yes. and an accessory to the fact. Mm -hmm. But he can let Jesus fulfill the punishment for my sins, and me let me accept Jesus' death as my death, and surrender unto that Amen. sentence and accept the gift of the life that Jesus gives Amen. and be set free from the law and its condemnation and be a part of the gift of his grace and of life. Amen. It's because Jesus voluntarily died as guilty in our place, became sin. He was made to be sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And not because some red liquid has the magical power to do something. And that's what I really want you to say, uh, to see here. We don't put the faith in the blood. We put the faith in the Christ. And we, we may sing about the, the cross. Uh, there are various songs about the cross you probably never hear, some of which there is a green hill far away, and things like that that maybe many of you have never heard. I've been around the college long enough and a lot of good song leaders. I've sung nearly every song in the book one time or another, <clears throat> but it's, it, I, I think there's risky to say, but if you get your understanding of Christianity only from the songs you hear sung, you're going to be deficient. Get it from the Bible. 
the Amen. the poet exercises poetic life license. The hymn sets you up with a with a particular direction of emotion, uh, things you appreciate, and sometimes that's largely due to your own heart and imagination. <clears throat> I want to be uh, warning you here, and yet. Uh, I don't want to speak derogatorily of those figures of speech that do stimulate our emotions and so forth. The first testimony to Jesus that's recorded is, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. But that didn't make him a source of wool. Is the Lamb only in respect that he was one who would, in, in complete innocence, suffer the penalty for our sin? When you understand just what's meant, you can go ahead and talk about the Lamb of God, about the blood of God, about the cross. And I still like to sing, Bane and blessing, pain and pleasure by the cross are sanctified. Mm -hmm. But the wood of the cross would never do it any, for anybody. Amen. Uh, I wouldn't have anything but uh, condemnation for a man who was selling pieces of the cross. And your baptism wouldn't be any better for in a whole pool of blood. We're not baptized in his blood. We don't contact the blood in baptism. We're baptized into his death. Amen. That's Amen. the biblical expression, and that's the real fact. But sometimes people, well, I'll just have to put it this way. At the Kaimisi Clinic, years and years and years ago, we had a speech <coughs> that in... Baptism, you contact the blood of Jesus. That's not a biblical expression, but that's what they, a lot of preachers say and in convincing people that you're baptized into the death of Jesus and appropriate the sacrifice of Jesus in obedience and baptism. Uh, I don't know why not just use more of the expressions of the Scripture, Amen. like in Acts 22:16, after Paul had met the Lord and believed and repented and would not eat or drink for three days and was praying in repentance, then he was told, Now why tarryest thou rise and be baptized and wash away thy sins? The promise of God is that sins are forgiven when the faith is active in baptism. Amen. But at baptism is just an action of faith. It's not a work of righteousness. It doesn't have any merit in itself. It's simply an appropriation of the death of Christ by faith. But this fellow was saying, we contact the blood in baptism, and the only other time that we contact the blood, 1 Corinthians 10, 16 says, the cup of blessing is a participation in the blood of Christ. So, not having studied logic or taught logic very many years, he said, <laughs> therefore, if you haven't had the Lord's Supper in the last seven days, you're not saved. Because that's only the blood of Christ. The blood of Christ cleanses us from all sin, is the biblical expression. People know a little bit here and a little bit there and a little bit there. Put it together, they got a monstrosity sometimes. Mm -hmm. that's right. And I can see why people appreciate the Lord's Supper. I want you to. But say it's the only way to be saved because it's the only participation in the blood and it's only the blood that saves. That ignores completely First John 1. 8 and 9. Amen. Amen. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And in the second chapter, he says, I write these things that you may not sin, but if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous, who gave himself and shed his blood for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. And the people argue about that means the whole world or only the believers in the world. And we can get off on many a tangent. But what a big jump we make sometimes. Well, people ask me if I would conduct the, Sunday, the Wednesday afternoon session at the clinic on the Lord's Supper. And I considered the kind of men we had there and the feelings they had and the, the opportunity I had. I had a couple of hours and sometimes fairly good attention. And I, I considered I wanted to do it, but I didn't want to stir up the conflict of feelings where I didn't have opportunity to teach them plainly enough to make it pay even to bring it up. So I taught some one week, one, yeah, one year on worship and uh, sometimes on other things that would come 
close to it and sort of prepare for it. And then one time I didn't go. A uh, young man brought to me a tape of the message he heard on the uh, this cup is the new covenant in my blood from Luke 22. And he was quoting, not as Dallas correctly translated for you this morning, the cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant blood. He was, this, this cup is the new covenant, my blood which is poured out for you for the remission of sins. And <clears throat> he took a different line of argument, but his assumption was that the one particular way in which we keep the covenant of the Lord is to partake of the Lord's Supper every seven days. Now, the seven days in itself is a matter of, uh, well, fair deduction, but not direct instruction from the Scripture. You read in Acts 2.46 that they uh, broke their bread with singleness of heart uh, every day in the temple. Sound like it, it's not maybe absolutely sure that they were having the Lord's Supper uh, in daily meetings, but it seems quite probable, and I think... Brother Gresham mentioned that two days ago. At Troas, the Acts 20, verse 7, the church met together on the first day of the week for the breaking of bread. And people think that this was uh, not only a regular first day of the week for them, but it was an example of what all the churches did under the apostles' instruction, and therefore that the Lord had given a commandment that the Lord's Supper must be observed every first day of the week. Mm -hmm. The Lord didn't say anything about what day to have the Lord's Supper on. Mm -hmm. The first day of the week is the day of the resurrection of Jesus. And outside the New Testament, within, within 25 or 40 years of the time that the New Testament was written, men like Ignatius... Uh, and a little later, Justin Martyr described the practice of the church, and uh, Ignatius said, we keep the, not the seventh day, but the eighth day, the day on which Jesus was resurrected, and they call it the first day of the week, but that peculiar idiom that is used in, uh, in uh, three, three or four places in the New Testament, the day one of the, New Te of the week, and because the word for week there is, Sabbaton, some people try to make on one of the Sabbaths instead of the first day of the week. And it's a matter of usage. The Greek language is pretty precise and, and not nearly as slippery as the English language, but all language tends to a certain vagueness and uh, secondary uses and, and gets a, a little uh, unsure, and somebody picks one of the most doubtful meanings and says, that's the meaning we have to hold to. This last speech, uh, I could even name the young man. He's such a powerful evangelist. Uh, I'd like to recommend him, and yet I can't recommend this position. I found out more about it when a, a church, well, some uh, people working in a church in an Indiana City wrote to me about the problem they were having over the, the preacher was well known to me, too. And so I stopped by and uh, asked one of the elders in the city, that I knew uh, to ask about what church is this? What, what, what should this be? I was asked to sort of intervene or write something that could be used in an argument. You never want to commit yourself to some kind of a club that people use against each other in an argument. You don't even know what it's about. And so Brother Duncan, David Duncan's father, Dave, told me what church it was and what was going on. And I called, and then I got an interview with the preacher. and. And the, he said the elders had had a meeting. They had modified the language in their instruction book to converts. And so, well, then it was taken care of. I didn't need to interfere. But they were getting that instruction that in order to remain a Christian and a member of the church, you had to have the Lord's Supper at least every seven days. This implies that the Lord's Supper somehow takes care of your sins for seven days more, and that's all. That kind of thing is so so mechanical, has so many assumptions in it, and is so fraught with fear and with misleading. Yes. When, when preachers have to use this kind of thing to get people to attend church, they're rather desperate, it seems to me. Amen. 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 
trying to prove that you have to have the Lord's Supper in order to be saved. That isn't the spirit of the worship of Christ in the Lord's Supper. Amen. You come to him because he is our Savior and we glorify him. We're not trying to purchase something for ourselves by coming to worship him. Some of your brethren will realize uh, in the way you talk, Brother Bates, uh, when I say that too often I've heard worship represented as a way of getting something from God and making sure of our standing when that isn't the point of worship at all. Amen. Amen. And this word fellowship has been made a matter of, of approval, endorsement, or enforcement of my ideas on you, and that isn't the point of fellowship at all. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> and the way we use words, and we get accustomed like this. Now, one of the main dangers about this matter of the communion of the blood is that we assign this expression to the Lord's Supper function only. We ritualize it and... Um, stereotype it and organize it and then we go on with our lives the communion is as I said belonging to sharing in um, living for and with uh, being uh, participation in these things of God I glad I get to remind you some of these good things said and I just want to warn you of the matter. You have been given a study here about seven pages long on blood or death, which is the right translation. And you may have that in your hand. This is not because it's my message today, but because this is a kind of thorough study that you can follow in order to come to understand the use of blood as a figure of speech. When the today's English version, Good News for Modern Man, translated mostly by Robert Brancher of the Bible Society, American Bible Society, came out, there were quite a few strong sermons against it, and uh, some magazines put a little box in repeatedly. The King James says blood here, and, and the TV says death. Blood, death, blood, death, blood, death. Finally, they do that about eight times. As they accuse the TV of trying to eliminate the blood of Jesus. There wasn't a word of truth in it. All those references had no reference to the blood of Jesus or to atonement. So that's why they're right here before you. There are sometimes when haima, the Greek word for blood, simply means physical blood. And in that case, where blood would be best uh, for the translation. When the figurative sense is clear in the passage or blood is clearly spoken of as a symbol with spiritual meaning, then blood can be best. But the Greek word haima in the New Testament or the Hebrew word dom in the Old Testament, frequently have the extended sense of violent death or responsibility for death or judicial death as a decree, which the English word blood does not carry and will not carry. In such places, it's probably best, certainly right, to translate them by death or a phrase that expresses the meaning that was conveyed by the Greek or Hebrew idiom. So the examples here... Um, the whole question is close to being a dispute over the form of words without having any great value. The question has arisen mostly because of severe opposition to a version that did not deserve the criticism. Search the scripture to see whether these things are so. It may take you some hours. Do not be surprised if this one period is just too short to see it plainly. But this discussion and the printed material we give you here give all the facts and passages from which you can study the issue. But why bother? Well, many millions of copies of the TEV New Testament have been used and given out by the church and can evangelize throughout the world. And if it does deny the Bible doctrine about Christ's atonement, it's very serious and it should be opposed. If it doesn't, then the false charge is a serious mistake, disturbing the faith of many, hindering the spread of the gospel, and dividing the church, and people have asked me about this matter, and it's to help them that I've collected this information. So you have it. The word for blood may mean death with violence of some sort. In the Old Testament, 203 times that's true. Connecting life with the blood, in Leviticus 17 especially, there are seven examples. Eating meat with blood, 17 examples. And prohibiting it, 12 of those times. 
not that it doesn't prohibit it at any time, but, but it specifically, it's mentioned especially to prohibit eating meat with the blood. Other uses 32 examples, including turning the Nile into blood eight times, processes of birth 12 times, bleeding three times, color three times. The most frequent use is to speak of death by violence. Now, down at the bottom paragraph there, the first page, the Greek word for blood is used in the New Testament 98 times, sometimes simply of blood without any implication of life or death or sacrifice, including five times just flesh and blood for meaning living human beings. Four references to the woman with the issue of the blood, and once the expression born not of blood, John 1.13. The most frequent use is to indicate violent death 25 times. This doesn't tell exactly how persons were killed. There may not have been any bleeding and still be called blood if it's violent death or judicial death. Out of the 100 times where the King James Version has blood, there are 36 times that the TEV, Good News from Other Man, leaves it out or alters the expression. In 20 of those instances, of the 36, there's no reference whatever to the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. In 16 of them, there's some statement about the blood or the death of Christ. So here are the 20. We'll just skip over those. You can see exactly what they are. But they have no, by, by leaving blood out of those passages, could not be opposing the doctrine of the blood atonement. The other 16 passages, Matthew 27, 4 saying, I have sinned in that I have betrayed innocent blood. Of course, it was the blood of Jesus. Why do you say innocent? Well, that's just an idiom of their time for saying, I have delivered up a man who was innocent to death. And death was what it was meant. Matthew 27, 24. Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but that a tumult was made, so he took water and he said, I'm innocent of the blood of this just person. And... He didn't mean atoning death at all. He meant, I'm innocent of a judicial death for this person. In Matthew 27, 25, then all the people said, his blood be on us and our children. That makes me shudder. That this means the guilt for his death be on us. And they still try to resist that. They, they made that sentence upon themselves, and then they won't forgive the world for remembering it. Acts 5, 28. No doctrine of atonement is under consideration at all. Did we not, did not we straightly command you that you should not teach in this name? You would bring this man's blood upon us. That is, guilt for his death has nothing to do with atonement. Acts 20, 28. <clears throat> to feed the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. There's the purchase with blood. Now that one has the connection, of course. But it's not wrong to say he made the church his own through death, through his own death. Interesting enough, the problems of translation and preservation of the text of the scripture uh, illustrated here. The King James said, through his own, with his own blood. Then the study of older manuscripts found many early manuscripts that said, the church of the Lord, which he purchased with his own blood. So the American Standard Version thought that was the original text and it got away from the idea of whether God died on the cross. And then they got back to the earliest papyri and the earliest investment that now the textual scholars decide the original was the church of God. So some want to translate it, the church of God, which he purchased with the blood of his own, because you could interpret it that way and make of his own the blood of Christ. Some people think God could not suffer. Bless your heart. <laughs> God loves, and loving means to suffer. Yes. And uh, Amen. The, uh, there, there's no right Amen. proposition that if you're God, you can't suffer. <laughs> suffering is not always the sign of guilt. Suffering is not always something that is worthless. Suffering can be very valuable. And the fact that God could suffer in his love for us is uh, very important in the personality of God and the nature of Christianity. Christianity is exceedingly personal. God reveals himself Amen. as a person. And speaking of God in the Old Testament, except when it talks about his hand or something like that, uh, is not anthropomorphic. It is simply representing the God in whose image we are made. And, uh, well, you can see the rest of these, the others of the 16, run like that. 
But there are 20 passages. No, I'm going backwards instead of forwards here in that particular thing. You got the uh, end of that. Turn, please, to page six. Does the TEV deny the New Testament doctrine of the blood of Christ as God used it to bring us salvation? No, it doesn't. To show that it really doesn't deny or change New Testament message about the blood of Christ, I wrote the accompanying study when I was asked for help on this subject by a former student. Note especially on page five the quotation of eight passages and the listing of references to 12 more which speak about salvation by or through the blood of Christ in that version. If you want to discuss this, to Ray Downing, he's like the TV version and used it prominent, predominantly for many years. Why then does TEV not use blood in every place where the Greek has the blood and meant blood? Uh, one of my good former students respectfully wrote to me after knowing about this study, said, but why bother about it? Why not? Use it? Because Americans speaking English don't understand what the Greeks were saying when they used the word blood for death. And if what they meant was death, death is the best translation. You can see where I had my notes here about this from the, the song we sang. We need not, we should not try to think of his death apart from the blood involved in it. Neither should we encourage people to trust in blood ceremonially applied without accepting his death as a personal suffering for us. Christianity is not a matter of ceremony or sacraments. Amen. Amen. The Amen. church, so-called church, the years, ages past, put baptism into magic salvation, whether people believed or not, and applied it to infants and so forth, and took the Lord's Supper and made it the mass by which the actual body and blood of Jesus is being sacrificed again, and it's a ceremony that has the power to take away sins, even for people who are not present, or people who are too drunk to know, or people who are already dead. And the church said that only those who were ordained in the unbroken line of succession, ordained from St. Peter and the, and the Pope, that these were the people who could administer baptism or the Lord's Supper. That's why people think it's strange if you let one of the deacons baptize his own son or something. They seem to think that only a preacher has a right to baptize. The Lord might do the church a favor if he just didn't let preachers baptize. <clears throat> the apostle said, I don't remember whether they're baptizing you or not, but the uh, household of Stephanus and uh, maybe a few others. He said, I didn't come to do the baptizing. I came to preach the gospel. Amen. And it didn't mean he was against baptism at all or meant to do without any baptism. But there is nothing that is especially effective in the act of baptism in itself without faith in Christ. There's nothing in the cup of blessing which we bless that will do anybody any good except as a fellowship with the blood of Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, when you turn these things into sacraments that function through the authority of the church and the peculiar powers allowed to the administrating officer, and uh, so forth, then you don't get Christianity anymore. You've got a system of ceremony, ritual, and uh, something saleable. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's what it became. Yeah. The service of the priest was sold. And when some nations had rulers that would not obey the Pope, the Pope would call off his priests. By the power of the interdict, he could say, no one, none of you can administer any sacrament to the people. Well, without the priest and the sacrament, the people knew no way to be forgiven their sins. And they were afraid of hell. And they would endure or dare anything whatever in rebellion against their rulers so the Pope would allow the priest to perform the sacraments for them. And that was the power of the interdict. And the overuse of that kind of power was what caused the Roman Church to incite a terrible rebellion against itself. In several instances, Martin Luther just the most successful of those, and he had something more than that understanding to, to go on. But uh, 
we do not want to make the communion something you had this morning or that is wrong on Thursday night or something like that. It's the fellowship of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now this was the outline I told Charles I was going to use. I think this subject needs to be uh, apprehended properly. That's what I'm trying to explain some. It needs to be appropriated personally, and it needs to be pre appreciated profoundly. Amen. Amen. And this is where some of you men are especially good at expressing your excitement and your feelings and uh, giving us more and more reason to appreciate it. There are four sides to our salvation, the forgiveness of sin, the salvation from death, the renewal of our minds by the uh, indwelling of the Holy Spirit, the new creature that Brother Leon preached so well about this morning, and the fellowship, belonging to the family, belonging to one another. Without our sins, we are condemned. Without the forgiveness of sins, we are condemned by our sins. Without the resurrection of Christ and the renewal in him, we are doomed to death because of that. And... Without the Spirit of Christ, we're not His. But the trouble is, without the transforming regeneration of the covenant we have with Christ, we are too independent-minded, isolated from each other, fragmented from the rest of society, especially in our day and age. I've noticed, especially in the last 15 or 20 years, Americans don't want to be responsible to anybody. They don't want to be responsible for anybody. They just want to do their own thing. Now, Christianity cures that kind of thing. Amen. About, about 1955, I had a copy of the, mm, what's the name of that, Expository Times from Scotland, in which some preacher of the United Kingdom put in a simple outline that was summarized there. I thought it was a great thing. He said, Jesus cures the deadly cancer of self, of self-rule, the desire to be outside the law of obedience. Everybody wants to do it my way and not have to obey anybody else. One of the things that afflicts the church today is women saying, I won't be submission to any man for anything. Or the people who think their children should not be in submission to their parents. Or that the people should not be submissive to the elders who watch for their souls. Now, elders should not try to subjugate the church. I don't think elders have any authority. I don't think you can get enough elders together in the whole state of Missouri to have authority to move a chair. Amen. But, Amen. but the members must be submissive and obedient to them. Amen. Not because they have authority. It's sort of like Ephesians 5.21. All of you be in subjection one to another, obedient to one another, Amen. in reverence for Christ. Amen. Amen. That means the elders must be obedient to the high school kids. Yeah! It goes both ways. It goes both ways. Not because somebody can make rules and enforce them on you, but because we must all be submitting our minds, hearts, desires, and wills to one another in fellowship. This is a wonderful thing the Lord has given to us, freedom from death, freedom from Amen. guilt. Amen. and salvation from ourselves by a Amen. new spirit, the spirit Amen. of Christ. Amen. But he also gives us each other. Amen. He gives us the body of Christ, which gives us a place to belong and to be somebody and to serve somebody. Amen. And he gives us a body that belongs to us and that supports us and surrounds us, and we become a part of a body and we can't stumble and fall without anybody caring. Amen. Amen. It's a great part of our salvation to be given to membership with one another. And when yeah. Ephesians 4 talks about lie not one another because you're members one of another, soak that up. That means a lot. Amen. Amen. Right. You don't want your right hand lying to your left hand. You'll get in trouble. Amen. Amen. But it's not contact with the blood that saves. It's the death of Christ that God accepted as the fulfillment of the law and that set us free from the claims of the law. And you could say in another figure of speech, like Colossians 2, 14, he nailed the law to the cross. And the 15th verse speaks rather obscurely. People don't. Thus he took 
the weapon out of the hands of the powers and principalities that were using it against us. And he triumphed over them in it. And Jesus fulfilled the law so the devil doesn't have a hold of it anymore to clobber given with. But it's the death of Jesus offered willingly before God in which he suffered the displeasure and the wrath of God against sin that we cannot fathom, we cannot imagine. It's not because his blood is magic. Now, I know in the, in the blood is the life, and that's why God, well, in Leviticus, he said at one point to stop you, he said, I gave you the blood upon the altar for an atonement for your sins. It's, yes, he did, but Hebrews 10 says that blood of bulls and goats could not take away sin. God gave it for atonement for sin, but it didn't work. Yes, it did. It worked for them because God gave it for their faith. It operated between them and God for the time, but it depended upon the death of Jesus. Amen. That's what Romans 3.26 is saying. In passing over those sins done aforetime, God was not wrong because he had given Jesus. Yes. You see, in time isn't an obstacle to God. Amen. And because Amen. the death of Jesus right. applies backward as well as forward. Amen. But the blood of bulls and goats did not work any magic. They did give a form of visual expression by which that great principle was taught. Life is the price of life, and yes. those the soul that sinneth shall die. Yes. Now, to rescue anybody from sin, there must be somebody die. Amen. Amen. So a lot of innocent lambs and little kids, goat kids, died. And a lot of grown animal, uh, sheep and goats died, and bullocks, that steers and... and <laughs> cattle. Think of all the thousands that died for nothing except to proclaim the death of Christ. Yes. Amen. Now what the animal sacrifices did in the Old Testament is just exactly what the Lord's Supper does for us. For them it pointed forward to that which really took away sins. Yes. And they could exercise their faith by the instruction that God gave them depending upon an atonement death. Yes. And we exercise our faith by the remembrance of the death of Christ which is the atonement death. Amen. The center of the whole thing is the cross. All the light of sacred story gathers around thy head sublime. Everything that be went before it was to prepare the way for it. Everything since the cross is to apply it to you and me and make it really effective. Amen. So don't belittle the Lord's Supper. Yeah. Do we need it? I do. I need it. We need Amen. it for remembrance. We need it for uh, the keeping the association with the Lord, for renewing the covenant, for keeping our, our hearts alive in fellowship with him. And I'd like to preach about fellowship. I think maybe better quit. <laughs> I'm asking you, since you heard Charles Gresham Tuesday on this subject, has it made any difference? Did you just forget it? So many of these speeches are received about like we receive the news on TV. It just goes by. We're too passive. Do you even know the three things I said are necessary here? That we know properly what the Lord did say as best we can, that we appropriate it personally in our own lives, and we appreciate it profoundly and always. Amen. 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 Is God real to you? Is the death of Amen. Jesus a real power in your life? Amen. He'll be real to you if you have intellectual grasp of the facts God has revealed about it. If you have emotional uh, response to him, and if you put it into practice by ethical control, the control of what Brother Jan preaches so well this morning about. For God to be real, he must be intellectually grasped, must be emotionally felt, and he must be ethically effective in your life. And if we don't respond to God with praise and thanksgiving, and emotional response, and with obedient manner of life by faith, working through love, he wants us to love him, then God will just be a theory, and we'll argue about theology and divide up over words. Whereas when we accept the Lord Jesus Christ personally, and he reigns in each one of us, you can't separate us because Amen. we're like spokes of wheel attached to him. The closer we get to him, the closer we get to each other. That's right. Amen. Amen. How do you identify yourself? Somebody asked you, or there's people here, you know, we wonder. Somebody was wondering who Brother Bill Reese is because he recently returned from Hong Kong. 
been away a long time. Many of you didn't know him and his family as I did. I've been in his home in Hong Kong, had his, all four of his children as students, and <clears throat> knew of his wife before she met and married Bill. <laughs> Melba Palmer and Gladys Swaki, missionaries in, in uh, Tibet, Batong, with Dr. Norton Bear. But there's not very many of us, George, that are old enough to have even heard of those things those days. Uh, how do you identify yourself? Somebody asked John the Baptist, if you're not Elijah and you're not the prophet, who are you? He knew. Yes, I'm amen. God's voice in the wilderness. Amen. Yes. If you ask the son of Zebedee, John, the brother of James, who are you? I'm the disciple whom Jesus loved. Yes. <laughs> Some people think that's kind of bold and, and proud of John, the disciple whom Jesus loved. I think that we can give John credit for saying, the only claim to identity I have is that the Lord Jesus loved me. Yes. Amen. 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 And he wrote the book in which, the, the story of Jesus' life, in which he himself had prominent parts. But he'd never give his name or his brother's name or his father's name anywhere in the book. Just that disciple whom Jesus loved. You ask the Apostle Paul, he started the epistle, epistle saying, the slave of the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it was necessary to say apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ and indicate what that apostleship meant as the instrument of God's revelation for you, for God's will. But anyway, the cross on which Jesus died is of central importance and yet we should not worship the cross. Amen. The Lord's Supper is a gift of God for us to remember. One time Jesse Young, me was at our Lord's table giving a little communion meditation, and he was, no, I guess during the prayer, he said, Lord, show us how we may express our love for you. Did you ever want to do that? Well, the Lord's Supper is just one way that we can proclaim his death till he comes again and express our gratitude to him and submit ourselves afresh to him. And you might even receive some forgiveness of sins while you're doing that. But it won't because, be because the Lord's Supper cup takes away sins. Amen. Actually, we need to give our, our thoughts to these things until... Now I've got a bunch of scriptures I'd like to read here. Being with the, in fellowship with the Lord through his blood is giving attention to him and to his words. In John 6, Jesus was saying shocking, shocking things. He preached a sermon to drive his crowd away in Galilee. Yeah, yes. Except you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in yourselves. Now, they were familiar with eating the meat of some of the sacrifices. But it still sounds strange when they say, unless you chew on my muscles and drink the blood out of my veins, well, this sounded so crazy. And drinking blood was so wrong for ever since the days of Noah, God had forbidden it. And it wasn't cannibalism they were interested in. And Jesus just sounded so... And when finally he said, The flesh profiteth nothing. It's the spirit that giveth life. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit amen. and they are life. Yes, amen. Now here's where I want to preach to you and leave it right with you. If we're going to eat the body and drink the blood of the Lord Jesus and have the communion of the blood, we're going to have to give attention with our minds to his word. Amen. Colossians 1, 3. If you be raised together with Christ, then seek the things that are above, not the things that are upon the earth. Set your mind on the things above. Where Christ is, seated at the right hand of the Father. Amen. And when Christ, who is our life, shall be manifested, you shall be manifested with him in glory. Amen. So you put away that which is human and fleshly and worldly, Amen. and you put on that which is of the nature of Christ. You get down to the 16th and 17th verse, you get a good little recipe what you do. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, with all wisdom teach and admonish one another, in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, sing of gratitude in your hearts unto God, and whatever you do in word or in deed, every word on the telephone, or on the job, or on vacation, anywhere, every word, do it as an agent of the Lord Jesus Christ in his name. Amen. giving thanks unto God the Father through him. Now the 15th verse ended up giving thanks to God. In the middle of the 16th verse, singing with gratitude in your hearts unto God. 
And Romans 1 indicated that when people did not give God thanks, yes. Yes. then they started their apostasy and departure from God. Amen. You want to have the communion of the blood and partake of the life of the Lord Jesus Christ that was in his body and blood and, and given for us, give attention to his word. First Peter, or Second Peter 1 Peter 1.3, God hath granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and virtue, by which also he gave to us his precious and exceeding great promises, that through these promises, how are they going to do that? Your attention to your faith in God's promises will keep you from going after something else. Amen. They promise you a good meal here tonight. Don't go look in the neighbor's garbage cans. Amen. And when God promises you all the joys of life and the fellowship with him and the everlasting life with him, uh, don't go to the movies for enjoyment. Amen. I, I didn't know whether to put this in because it's new for you to hate me for. <laughs> If partaking of the groceries on the idol table was some kind of an idol uh, identification with those idols, I think going to the movie theater is participating in the work of Satan in this society of ours Amen. today. Amen. I really do. Amen. I could not tolerate myself, I might tolerate you, I could not tolerate myself paying the money and taking the time to go to the movies and soak, soak my mind up with that stuff that they put out in Hollywood for the purpose of destroying the common sense, family values, and civilization of the United States of America. Now, I didn't lay down any law. I just tried to reason with you. <laughs> Why not eat at the feast that's free on the street? Well, maybe your neighbor will be hurt, he said in the 8th chapter. Here he says, I don't want you eating at the table of demons. There are other ways that we can partake of the table of demons. And those demons are obvious enough in our society around us. The people that we know right here in town. Tuesday afternoon, David and I were facing one, and we held down the person who was having the convulsion in the expulsion of a demon. I never saw the movie Exorcist, and I don't even uh, condone it. But I have seen this week the necessity of praying the demons out of people that want to be delivered by the power of God. And we promote that. And I think one of the biggest reasons for that demon that day was the movie she watched the night before. And that's what David put his finger on that right there. So you want to be in the covenant with Jesus. Use your mind and in your heart. Appreciate him. Try to understand the scripture. Don't just ritualize and ceremonialize and make a ritual out of the Lord's Supper, but make a reality of the life and death of Jesus in your life Amen. and let him fill your thoughts. Guard your heart and your thoughts in peace and in purpose in that new creature mind that Leon was preaching to us about. Amen. Amen. Amen.